Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the CAQH Core webinar. We're really excited to present to you our new set of new and updated operating rules. Um, so we'll start off today's webinar with a overview of CAQH Core, and then we'll dive into the different operating rules, starting with the attachments operating rules. Uh, and then looking at the prior authorization and healthcare claims use cases. We'll then uh, explore the updated CQH core infrastructure rule requirements, followed by the updates to the CQH core eligibility and benefits data content rule. After the presentations, we will dive into a Q&A portion. Some housekeeping items. You can download the presentation slides now from the handout section of the GoToWebinar menu. You can also download the presentation slides and recording on our website after the webinar. Additionally, the, a copy of the webinar slides and recording will be emailed to all attendees and registrants in the next business day. Uh, please feel free to forward the, those uh, materials to anyone in your organization who might be interested. Finally, questions can be submitted at any time using the questions panel on the GoToWebinar dashboard. I want to thank our speakers and co-chairs who were pivotal in leading these uh, development efforts. And they're joining us on the call today, Donna, Molly, and Mahesh. And now I'll turn it over to Erin Weber. Great, thanks Daphne, and thanks everyone for joining us today. And thanks especially to uh, Donna, Molly, and Mahesh for supporting the development of our operating rules by serving as co-chairs and taking the time out to share the new rules with the industry today. I know we have a number of new individuals and organizations on the line today. We have nearly 500 registrations for this session. So I'm gonna spend a couple moments um, providing some background around CAQH Core and our participating organizations, and then turn it over to our speakers to talk more in detail about the new and updated operating rules that we're excited to share with industry. For those that are less familiar, CAQH Core is a, a participant-led um, initiative uh, founded shortly after HIPAA passed uh, to initially support the development of operating rules to support the exchange of the HIPAA mandated standards. Um, so when you're thinking about those standards, we mean eligibility, claims, payment and remittance advice, those core revenue cycle transactions um, that industry really worked to automate um, in the early 2000s. Um, through our work there, we collaborated with the financial services industry to develop a model around operating rules. Operating rules and standards are common across many different industries, not just healthcare, including transportation uh, uh, and uh, financial services, um, to develop the core model. Um, and our mission is really to drive the creation and adoption of healthcare operating rules to support standards, accelerate interoperability, and align administrative and clinical activities across providers, payers, and consumers. Um, now, I mentioned CORE started as a voluntary initiative. The industry came together recognizing the need for greater uniformity in how these standard transactions are exchanged. Um, but in 2010, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, CAQH CORE was named the National Operating Rule Author and Entity uh, by the Department of Health and Human Services to develop and uh, support operating rules for all of those HIPAA-covered administrative transactions. And this was part of the uh, Affordable Care Act. Um, we see our role not just to bring the industry together to develop and create the operating rules and associated requirements, but also to uh, educate the industry around the importance of operating rules and standards to support interoperability to drive adoption of those operating rules through our certification program and to ensure that those rules are having an impact on the industry through our pilot and measurement efforts. We are governed by a multi-stakeholder board of directors with representatives from health plans, providers, and vendors, um, as well as a number of advisors, including leadership from all of the standards development organizations and meeting. 
On the next slide, um, I just want to highlight um, some of our participating organizations. We have actually more than 110 organizations that participate in CORE, and the health plans participating in CORE represent about 75% of insured lives in the United States. Um, this is a really uh, strong group of organizations that have joined CORE to participate, develop operating roles, and demonstrate their commitment to administrative simplification. Um, these organizations commit resources um, from the individuals and experts within their teams to support our rule development efforts, our certification efforts, um, and attend education sessions that are specific for participating organizations. Next slide. There are now eight sets of CAQH core operating rules, and they support all the key revenue cycle functions. Three sets of the operating rules, the eligibility and benefits, claim status, and payment and remittance operating rules are federally mandated and required for implementation by all HIPAA-covered entities. Um, the other operating rules are available for voluntary implementation, and organizations are uh, implementing these rules and becoming certified on these rules because they represent best business practices. Um, if you're interested in seeing the details of the operating rules and learning more, I encourage you to go to our website where all of the rules are available for free and more information around the requirements, FAQs, implementation guides, and details about our certification program are available. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how we identify these specific rule areas that we'll talk about today for priority in 2021. Um, each year, our board of directors uh, identifies a set of goals for the initiative to achieve and work towards. They identify priority topics and how we wanna go about addressing those within the industry. Very specifically for 2021, the board recognized the need to update some of our existing operating rules to meet uh, emerging and current business needs. Um, as I mentioned, CORE was founded, um, I think, in 2008. And so some of those early operating rules, such as the eligibility rules, um, needed uh, some updates uh, as well as connectivity. Um, to align with current business practices and new needs like telemedicine that weren't around 10 years ago. The board also recognized the need to develop operating rules to better align administrative and clinical activities in an environment where healthcare data exchange is rapidly evolving. Um, and the area of focus for this is really around the new attachments operating rules and the need to automate the exchange of this additional documentation to support the claims and prior authorization workflows. And finally, uh, an area where the board has been focused is thinking through how do you align um, emerging and existing standards and technology to ensure current expectations for data exchange um, to close automation gaps and address these changing business needs. And so the board has been thinking a lot about the role of standard agnostic operating rules to support this industry transition between current and emerging standards. And you'll see some of that in the requirements that are included in the new attachments operating rules, which address a variety of standards. Next slide. So I'm gonna turn it over to our experts now to uh, share some of the detail around what is included in these operating rules and how were they developed. I do wanna highlight that the level of industry engagement um, for both the development of the new rules and updates to the existing rules was very high. We had more than 65 organizations submitting ballots and actively voting in support of the rules with 88 percent of those organizations supporting at a minimum each of these rule sets. So um, thank you to all of our participating organizations. Uh, we could not do this without your input and your support and your expertise. And we look forward to uh, working with you all across the industry on next steps, which I'll share later in the presentation. I'll now turn it over to Bob Bowman, um, our core 
uh, principle of interoperability and standards to talk in more detail about some of the attachments work. Huh? Great, thanks Aaron. Good afternoon. Um, we can move over to the next slide where it's important for us to make sure that everyone understands what we mean by an attachment. And that really is the medical information or supplemental information or documentation that's required often by a health plan. Um, and as you can see from the latest information from the CAQH index, much of the exchange of this type of information, whether it's a dental x-ray to support the extraction of a supernumerary tooth, or um, several pages of a health record to support um, an MRI with, with or without contrast, that is very much done today in a manual process, um, either through mail, fax, or email, uh, or provider portals even. Um, so it makes it really interesting for our discussions as we started this process. Um, if most of the industry is supporting um, their submission of electronic attachments or attachments, um, through a manual process, how do we as an industry move forward to make this more automated? Um, especially when there's such a diversity um, in the marketplace today in the different modes and methods and means of submitting that data electronically. So some folks have implemented the X12 transactions, some folks have implemented HL7 transactions, some use the web, some use VPN, some use a web portal. Um, so it's kind of all over the place. So what we have done, just as Aaron mentioned, we went through an extensive process. And some of that's detailed on the next slide, on slide 14, where we identified a number of opportunities for our participating organizations to begin their conversation and that dialogue. Um, we particularly worked on the two use cases that kind of rose to the top, both PA, prior authorizations, and claims. Um, through the course of two years, we worked on developing a set of requirements for each of these use cases. Uh, through a number of calls, for all polls, ballots, we had lots of debate, lots of discussion. But ultimately, by reaching consensus, the participating organizations at CORE really came together and supported very high levels of support, some of the highest we've ever had in any of our operating rules requirements or development, for that matter, um, of 88, 90 percent. Um, really to see that the board looked at that consensus approach that the industry took for these particular sets of requirements and approved unanimously those sets of requirements. Um, but what are those sets of requirements? What do they really look like? Um, you can see that we do have uh, two sets of rules, um, one for the prior authorization use case and one for the claims use case. They each have an infrastructure rule that really allows and establishes um, the foundation and foundational types of requirements for interoperability. It ensures that there is um, a way to conduct the transaction, right? Laying the tracks from point A to point B, so you know how what that connectivity method looks like, what those requirements are. To understand how you um, set up a system or an application um, on one end of that train track and the, and the other end of the train track and any stops along the way. Um, also, we establish a set of uh, specific data content requirements for both the PA and the claim. This ensures because um, foundationally, as we know, much of this is done um, in a very manual process today, and even the electronic methods, it's a bifurcated process. You submit a prior authorization inquiry um, or request, you submit a claim. After the fact, often several days later, you find out that the additional documentation is required. So it's a not a real-time request and a response transaction or interaction between a health plan and a provider, between a provider and a health plan. Today, it's bifurcated, it's broken, it's in two different pathways. You submit the inquiry, you submit the claim, wait and see what is how it is adjudicated, then you're requested to submit that additional documentation. Then the provider finds that additional documentation and submits that additional documentation. Um, because of that, we have to ensure that as we move to a fully integrated, fully automated process, those pathways to get there. Um, these rule requirements do that both through establishing the infrastructure requirements as well as the um, data content requirements, which is, ensures reassociation between the two different transactions that may come in, um, either at different times, different days for that matter, different weeks for that matter, um, to even if they are within the same type of interaction, uh, they both can come in and be reassociated one with the other. Aaron also mentioned that we set up um, the cert certificate, um, uh, sorry, the certification test scenarios. So entities that wish to pursue certification or wish to set up their systems and applications today, they are ready to go. They can actually 
look at what those certification test scenarios are, how they'll have to demonstrate a compliance and conformance with them, and ensure that they meet those requirements. Um, something else that's also really important, and you'll find on the next slide, is that we looked at the industry, how it's has implemented um, attachments today, where the industry is heading for tomorrow, and then we have to roadmap that up and how we get there. So the rule requirements do focus on two different scenarios, one that supports the 275 method, which many have implemented today, and also a non-X12 method for those folks that wish to pursue different types of technologies and or requirements uh, for those types of interactions. So you'll see within the rule itself, a non-X12 method and an X12 method. Um, as always, our payload type here um, is agnostic. So either you support the core connectivity um, with the 275 or without, and it allows for the sender or the receiver to receive or use any variety of payload types. It could be the CCDA, it could be a PDF, it could be a JPEG, et cetera. What's important here to note also with the connectivity is that the core connectivity, the version four, allows the continued support of the open internet, the public internet, uh, for SOAP transactions, as we've traditionally have had since 2006, since we established our connectivity requirements, that also crack this open a couple of years ago to allow for RESTful API interactions within the core connectivity requirements too. So if you are interested in pursuing a FHIR-based interaction for the support of attachments on the core connectivity model with its RESTful API uh, connectivity requirements is also available for uh, that support. So again, the attachments for these rules address core connectivity uh, for both the traditional SOAP method as well as the more progressive RESTful API technology uh, that is uh, cracking into the market as well. Um, lastly, what's important to note, and again, um, Aaron touched on this, is that the core participants uh, came together and understood the assignment and wanted to make sure that as they approach the requirements um, for attachments for these use cases, that there has to be a definable set of benefits for adoption. Now, on the next slide, you'll see that there are some key benefits that were identified through the development of the requirements and the operating rules um, associated with them. Those include uh, the industry is converging continuously towards clinical administrative data, especially with the HRs and PMS systems becoming more integrated. The use of those systems and applications and how they interface between a provider and a health plan is going to be key. So the infrastructure requirements are key, right? We have to be able to understand from one system, one application to another, even if they're not necessarily the same product, right? Not everyone is on Epic, but everyone is using Change, for example. Not everyone is on the same system. So however we plug into that system or network, um, they have to be able to interoperate. And the core rules establish that through key infrastructure requirements. Also key, as I mentioned before, is reassociation. As the industry makes systems that are more interoperable and more um, real time, right now they're not there. Right now, claims adjudication is a batch process. Prior authorization is a manual process. So how do we go from um, you know, Flint tools to space age technology um, where well, we don't do that overnight? We actually have to set up a systems and applications and the technology to do that often in an iterative approach. So reassociating claims and the prior authorization inquiries or submissions with the attachments that come later is really important. So we've done that as well uh, with these rule sets. And last but not least, um, all of this will lead to better patient care because the information and data to support those types of care needs that patients have can be expedited through the combination of not just the um, attachment requirements here for PA and claims, but also looking at the other previous rule sets that Aaron mentioned, that within this entire milieu of requirements for claims and claims attachments and prior authorizations and prior authorization attachments, those rule sets, those previous ones from two, three, four years ago, combined with this latest set really allows application vendors and health plans and providers to move to a more integrated model when it comes to the delivery of their technology and the interactions for these types of transactions. I know you're on uh, waiting for the details for what these types of requirements are. So with that, I'll hand the call over to Mahesh to break, his, break down some of the specific requirements. Mahesh? Thank you, Bob. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
now that we've heard an overview of the process to draft the attachment rules and so the high level background, we'll get into the details of the attachments operating rules, starting with their prior authorization use case. Um, as our work group convened to develop rule requirements, we assess the pain points at each step in the prior authorization workflow. In the, in the first step, when the X12-275 attachment is submitted uh, with the X12-278, um, the key barriers identified were that additional clinical documentation required is not consistently available to providers in an electronic format in a uniform location, and systems are sometimes not available to accept the attachments. In the second step of the workflow, when the health plan receives and acknowledges the attachment, there is often inconsistent confirmation that the attachment was received, uh, which leads to duplicate submissions and manual follow-up from the provider to ensure that the information was received. Next, the health plan processes the attachment. However, there are currently no standard methods to communicate errors to the provider which leads to inconsistent confusion um, and unnecessary follow-up to clarify any errors before the provider resends the information. Additionally, there is a wide range of capabilities in terms of um, the maximum file size systems can accept, leading to attachments that are not accepted due to their size. In the next step, help plans link an accepted attachment to the original PA request or claim submission the process of relinking or reassociating an attachment to a PA is currently extremely manual and often results in lengthy back and forth between providers and plans to ensure that the current attachments are, are being linked with appropriate prior authorizations. This often leads to delays to adjudicate the PA. After undergoing this process, the, either the PA workload is complete or the health plan requests additional information to adjudicate the PA. Next slide, please. The work group set out to address these key workflow roadblocks in, in our develop in the rule development process. We'll review the requirements included in the rules and then show how they fit into the workflow. All the requirements listed on the slide align with the infrastructure requirements and existing core infrastructure operating rules, with the exception of file size. As Bob mentioned, requirements can apply to either the X12 and or the non-X12 method for sending an attachment. This is key to the flexibility of the rules, meeting organizations where they are, along with the technology spectrum, while allowing those who may be more advanced to adhere to the same requirements to exchange attachments using some of their more emerging technology. In the attachments prior authorization infrastructure rule, the requirements that apply only when the Attachments are sent using X12-275 include uh, processing mode, the companion guide, acknowledgement, and data error handling requirement. These are on the right side of the, um, of the slide. Requirements that apply when attachments are sent using the X12 method and non-X12 method are on the left side of the slide and include system availability, connectivity, and file size. These key requirements establish maximum response time for acknowledgement in batch and real-time processing modes, minimum, minimum for the document size and the amount of data that, can be, that must be supported. We heard time and time again that a problem specific to the exchange of attachment is not knowing whether a file will be accepted due to the file size. So this requirement establishes a minimum size file that the help plans or the vendors must accept, and the providers will now know if it will be accepted if it is sent. Standard error codes to exchange, um, minimum system availability, and common format and flow of information uh, in companion guides. Next slide, please. The data content rule builds on the infrastructure requirements to establish common codes and data elements that should be used to assist with reassociation. As mentioned, another common pain point heard across the stakeholders communities was that 
was that of reassociation or linking an attachment to the original PA request. Using lessons learned from our prior core operating rules, such as payment and remittance rule, to associate the EFT with the ERE, we developed rules which fulfill data needs that immensely assist with the reassociation re process. More specifically, providers are encouraged to send the established common data elements when sending an extol or non extol attachments for ease of reassociating the attachment to the original prior authorization. Next slide, please. Here we highlight how the detailed requirements included in the infrastructure and the data content rule fit within the PA workflow to enable a more timely and less burdensome exchange of attachments to reduce time of adjudication of PA and ultimately patient care delays. Our requirements address each step of the workflow from an increase in system availability, which allows providers to send additional information during extended hours, to requirements around reassociation to assist with identification and linking, the request of the attachment so a PA can be adjudicated. Again, I want to mention that requirements may apply both to X12275 and non X12275 payload formats, highlighting the flexibility that we will need to see through the industry as adoption of the electronic attachment increases. Now on the requirements that apply to attachments sent to support health healthcare claim submissions. Next slide, please. Through the process of developing the PA attachments operating rules, the work group recognized the overlap. Uh, many of the requirements would have with attachments sent to support claim submissions and the in establishing requirements around the attachments workflow for claims would provide immense value to the industry. The work group then developed claims attachments operating rules with requirements that mirror those of uh, those for the PA attachments with the addition of a handful of requirements specified to claims. Like the PA rules, these requirements may apply to the X12275 and non X12275 payload formats. In addition to the requirements outlined in the previous section that are mirrored in the claims attachments infrastructure rule, the rule also establishes uh, requirements for electronic policy access and ability to ability for multiple attachments to be uh, to support a single claim submission. The inclusion of these requirements really reflects the high adoption of electronic submission of claims compared to the prior authorizations requests in the industry and the complexity of many PA requests. For example, the electronic policy access requirement says that health plans must offer an electronic method for identifying the attachments information needed to support a claim submission. There is an area for prior authorization use case core, uh, that the core participants elected to potentially address in an update to the rule, citing the wide variance in medical policies based on member plans and potentially and potential necessity for the prior authorization decision to be made before knowing the attachments that may be necessary. Next slide, please. Similarly, the data content rule for claims attachment focuses on reassociation of an attachment to the original claim submission, specifying the use of appropriate loan codes to the request uh, to request the most specific information needed to support the claim submission. Again, here we highlight how the requirements unique to the claims workflow fit into the process mirroring and building upon the PA attachments requirements. With these requirements, the rules establish key infrastructure requirements that align with core infrastructure rules and provide the information necessary to send electronic attachments as we've seen successful in our prior core infrastructure rules. They also simplify a major pain point in the attachment process. Linking an attachment sent separately from a prior authorization or a claim with the associated request or claim submission, a process that is currently incredibly manual. As, of, as all of this enables consistent electronic exchange of clinical information, leading to quicker coverage, decision, uh, coverage decisions that support patient care, which is really at the crux of all of these rules. 
With that, I'll hand over uh, the presentation over to Molly Rees from AMA to discuss our next topic. Thanks, Mahesh. Um, so infrastructure rules. Um, as many of you who have been engaged with CORE for some time know, each set of operating rules includes an infrastructure rule with requirements by transaction for processing mode, response time, system availability, connectivity, acknowledgements, and companion guides. Uh, some of these infrastructure requirements were initially written more than 10 years ago during the early phases of CAQH core operating rules development. And um, three infrastructure rules are federally mandated. And those would be the eligibility, claim status, and payment and remittance rules. Uh, those are denoted in the purple box on the slide. So the infrastructure rule update was initiated following feedback from industry stakeholders and the CAQH core board to adjust and align requirements to meet um, advancing technology and evolving business needs throughout the industry. Uh, core participants were surveyed in August of 2020 to gauge support for updating system availability and response time requirements across all rule sets. Um, ultimately, the group decided to increase system availability and adjust connectivity and companion guide requirements across the rule sets. The updated requirements received high support from CAQH core voting organizations with 90% of organizations approving the update. Um, in February 2022, the CAQH core board unanimously approved the update to the rules. And moving forward, um, again, so through the survey and review by the review work group, a clear consensus emerged to make updates across all eight infrastructure rules. Um, and there was significant discussion related to system availability needs. The review work group participants agreed to increase weekly system availability to 90% per calendar week. Uh, this increase in weekly system availability actually represents a reduction in downtime by 364 hours annually. The group also agreed to add in a quarterly system availability requirement so that health plans and their agents may use 24 additional hours of system downtime per calendar quarter for system migrations, mitigation, and more integrated system needs that may require downtime in excess of the allowable weekly system downtime. And uh, note that processing mode response time requirements were not updated as consensus was not reached. So the requirement remains at 20 seconds for real time and the requirements vary for batch processing according to use case. Um, and next slide, please, yeah. Along with an increase in system availability, core connectivity and uh, core companion guide requirements were adjusted for increased clarity um, and uniformity across the rule sets. So specifically, all infrastructure rules were updated to reference the most recent version of the CAQH core connectivity rule. This means that by January 2023, CAQH core connectivity version C4.0.0 will be required for all infrastructure rules as core certified entities will be required to comply with the most recent version of CAQH core connectivity within two years of publication. Additionally, companion guide references to specific X12 versions will be modifiable moving forward. Uh, as the companion guide templates are currently written, they're to be used in tandem with the X12 version 5010 only. And with this change, the companion guide will be usable with any version, uh, and that will promote fl flexibility as we continue to move forward as an industry. So these updates will provide immediate benefits to the industry. By aligning today's technology and business needs with updated requirements, we ensure that industry best practices that may have evolved in the, next, in the past 10 years uh, since developing the rules are still being met. Uh, providers will also have improved access to necessary data, which will ultimately improve care delivery, the patient experience, and the revenue cycle. And finally, recognizing that today's systems are more integrated than ever, the transition to the most recent version of core connectivity encourages the use of both existing and emerging technology, and a modifiable CAQH core companion guide template facilitates the flexibility to transition to new versions of standards as the industry continues to look towards the future. Um, I'll now turn things over to Donna Campbell. Thank you, Molly. 
Uh, the last item to review is uh, the update to the eligibility and be benefit data content rule. Um, if we wanna move to slide 34. Before I deep dive into the requirements, I want to provide some background around the eligibility and benefits and highlight the industry need for an update. Eligibility and benefits generally and most familiarly uh, refers to, I might've made that word up, refers to an inquiry from a provider to a health plan or from one health plan to another to obtain eligibility coverage or benefits associated with the plan and a response from the healthcare plan to the provider. The federally mandated CAQH core eligibility and data content rule has proven they reduce time and cost associated with the transaction by requiring the return of uniform data elements in real time for electronic eligibility, coverage, and benefit transactions. Some of the key existing rule requirements include benefit information, such as the inclusion of patient financials for coinsurance, copayment, and base and remaining deductibles, in addition to the mandatory and discretionary service type codes name normalization, and the AAA error code reporting requirements. While the 2021 CAQH index demonstrates that the electronic adoption has increased to 89%, the transaction has also had the highest savings opportunity amongst the electronic transactions. Such significant saving opportunities for, transaction, for a transaction that enjoys high electronic adoption implies gaps have naturally emerged since the version of the standard and the operating rule requirements were initially developed and implemented. The updates to the data content rule address some of those known gaps. I'm going to move to slide 35. As with the attachments and the infrastructure rule development processes, the method of updating the eligibility and benefit data content rule was intensive, often facilitated by compromise and consensus. Beginning in 2020, CAQH core participants, such as yourself, identified the eligibility and benefit business process as an area for CAQH core to prioritize for operating rule development given evolving business needs. In early 2021, a task group convened to evaluate opportunity areas to enhance the rule. And overall that rule, those rule updates were discussed at more than 10 task groups and work group meetings, had over six draw polls and feedback forums, and received 88% approval from CAQH core voting organizations and unanimous approval from the CAQH core board. Slide 36. The updated rule requirements fall into six categories. They are telemedicine, service type codes, remaining coverage benefits, procedure codes, prior authorization, certification, your benefits. As we know, over the past few years, telemedicine has seen a, a huge rise in use and the updated requirements address this emerging need by requiring the use of the CMS's uh, place of service code for professional healthcare claims. Uh, when we talked about it as a variety on calls, there was a code value 02, but since the beginning of the year, 10 has been added, and these two codes indicate what service or benefit is available for telemedicine. Additionally, the update adds 71 new discretionary service type codes and 55 new mandatory service type codes for a total of 178 core required service type codes. For remaining coverage benefits, the update supports the communication of the number of visits or services left on a benefit by requiring health plans return maximum benefit limitations and their remaining benefits for 10 core required remaining coverage benefit service types. Similarly, the update enhances requirements to respond to eligibility and benefit requests at the procedure level, such as the CPT or hip picks for physical therapy, occupational therapy, surgery, and imaging. It also requires the communication if a prior authorization or certification is required for a, for a core required service or procedure. And lastly, the rule update provides more granular level of data for members of tier benefit plans, including coverage status, patient financial responsibility, 
remaining be uh, benefit coverage, authorization or certification status, and then the in and out of network determination. As mentioned, the eligibility and benefit operating rules were the first set of rules developed by the core participants and were the launching point uh, for CAQH core nearly a decade ago. It definitely makes me feel quite old and aged because it's been mentioned at least three times that that was about 10 years ago. And I know I was one of those original participants to work, participants to work on these rules. Um, the updated rule reduces the administrative burden associated with verifying information by allowing the plans and providers to readily identify which services and benefits are covered. The rule provides much needed granular information within a, um, various priority categories, such as telemedicine, a new business need that obviously resulted because of COVID and in recent years has become very popular and necessary. Finally, the rule will enable more accurate pricing and billing practices due to enhanced access to eligibility information prior to or at the point of service in real time. And again, these updates tackle widely shared gaps that have developed in the years since the rule was initially created, that would be 10 years ago, and begin to address some of the opportunities for cost saving throughout the industry. And I personally am excited to see these rules come to fruition and prove their value to us as stakeholders. I'll now hand things over to Daphne for a polling question. Thank you, Donna. Uh, before we get into our uh, next steps and Q&A portion, a uh, quick polling question uh, to gauge interest in participation, certification, or our pilot and ROI uh, initiatives. Uh, we'll then follow up with you if you have any questions about joining any of these, these programs. I'll keep it open for another 30 seconds, but if anyone wants to, uh, has any questions uh, that they would like us to address during the Q&A portion, uh, please submit them uh, in the panel to your right. Alrighty. Now I will turn it back over to Erin. Thanks, Daphne. So you all just heard a lot of detailed requirements and uh, information on the new and updated operating rules, which really demonstrates the level of precision, the level of detail that the core, per core participants put into this effort. Um, you know, the, the goal is really to drive greater automation. Um, we know today that about only 20% of attachments are exchanged electronically. Um, with operating rules, we can do this in a more consistent, common manner, regardless of the underlying standard. Um, the rules also address new business needs. When you think about telemedicine or system availability differences over the last few years, and also more complicated benefit designs, the new eligibility updates will help address this and provide uh, physicians and health systems the information they need at the time of service um, to ensure payment. Um, I guess the next question is, you know, why should you, why should we as an industry care about this? You know, that publishing the rules, developing the rules is just the first step in the process. It's a difficult step. You heard our co-chairs today talk a lot about the uh, discussion and, and colorful debates that happen in our work group meetings, um, but that really the next thing is for your organizations to evaluate the operating rule requirements and consider how they might impact automation within your own organization and then implement the rules to drive greater interoperability. Um, from CORE's perspective, there are a number of next steps that we are working on to drive uh, adoption. The first is um, working with our board to develop a package of rules to send to the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics, which is a federal advisory body to HHS on topics related to HIPAA administrative simplification, among others. 
Um, and that package will include both um, some of the new and updated rules you heard about today um, so that, that the industry will be able to comment on the value of uh, mandating some of these requirements across the industry. Um, because as we learned, if just one organization in the data exchange process is following the rules, not everyone will benefit. But if the entire industry is working under the same set of rules, we will have true um, and improved interoperability. We are working now to update our testing platform to support core certification for these new and updated operating rules. Um, and we continue to drive our ROI uh, measurement efforts. We have built a data collection component into our certification process that will help us better understand the impact the rules are having, um, both at an organization and industry level. And then finally, um, we have updated our website with all of the new and updated rules and corresponding updated FAQs and implementation tools. So I encourage you to go there as a first step as you assess um, whether this is uh, the right decision for your organization to pursue. Next slide. Um, and then finally, um, you know, just as a call to action, we continue at CAQH Core to work with our industry partners to measure the impact of operating rules um, on the, an industry's efficiency met metrics. So if you are interested or working on an attachments process and you think these rules could play a role in your implementation, reach out to us. Um, we just we would be more than happy to have a conversation, talk through whether this might be a good opportunity to do a more formal study with us, um, become core certified as you think through your budget and your prioritization for the coming year, um, consider where core certification might fit in. And then I think probably the most important thing I would encourage is that if your organization is not already participating with CAQH4, um, consider joining us. Um, you can email our contact information for at caqh.org. We're happy to have a call with you to talk through um, whether this would be of value to your organization and what the specific benefits our core participation are beyond participation in the subgroups and workgroups. But it is a really great opportunity to hear um, and contribute to industry-wide conversations um, trying to solve some of today's most pressing challenges related to interoperability. Um, so with that, I believe I will be handing it back to our moderators to go through some Q&A. And I don't hear anything, so I just wanted to see if um, Stephanie, are you there? Yeah, there you are. <laughs> the old mute button <laughs> every time. <laughs> um, so, starting it off with a question about uh, the timeline for expected changes and updates uh, to be both available on our website um, and for the new requirements to be to be effective. Uh, Bob, can you mind taking this one? Great. Yeah, and also anyone else on the panel too can add in. Um, I think one thing that we'll see is that we, we've already had a lot of folks interested in the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years on attachments. We even have some vendors and clearinghouses that are already in the process of doing their gap analysis and wanting to implement the prior authorization rule. So um, you'll see the industry uptake, I think, will be um, quick and steady. Um, for many of these requirements, um, because these requirements, I think, as our panel mentioned, um, are things that the industry has really kind of been wanting and needing for quite a while now. So we're really trying to meet the industry where uh, we're really trying to meet the providers where they're at. They need the information, particularly around the eligibility requirements. They need to have a better way of submitting attachments to support both claims and prior authorizations. Um, I know there is continued challenge within the industry for the support of the X12-278 for prior authorization, but much of that is because the infrastructure, um, the background, the back-end systems at health plans are not fully automated to support real-time transactions. 
um, right? Many of these transactions are batch based, right? They, you submit them one day and come back and try to get the response the next day. Um, so these types of infrastructure requirements, um, the requirements supporting um, the uh, data content for that type of model of submission and request, the request and response and, and that type of thing. Um, you will see the industry is moving towards um, making that more fully automated, integrated with their current systems that they already have for eligibility and claim status inquiry and claim submission for that matter. Um, so we have had a number of entities already approach us for um, certification. We've had a number of entities already look at the requirements. Um, we are in the process of updating our websites and posting all of this information. It's all available for free on our website um, today. And that includes the information that um, if you are interested in certification, um, those test suites are available. The, the technical requirements are all available. Everything's available for you. And Bob, this is Erin. I'm just going to build on that. Um, there's a couple questions I see around uh, timelines here. And, you know, there are really two timelines that, that we can talk about. The first is the timeline for core certification compliance. So the core certification program has both a uh, initial certification process and then a recertification process. And Per core certification policy, organizations have two years to comply with any updated operating rule requirements. Um, so you can work with our certification team to determine um, where you fall in that timeline related to these updates. But there is um, you know, a, a recognized lag time that organizations are going to need some time to plan and prepare to implement these new requirements. Some of these updated requirements, um, as many of you have noted, relate to some of the federally mandated operating rules. So the eligibility and benefits data content and infrastructure rule, as well as the claim status infrastructure rule and the electronic remittance advice infrastructure rule. Those are all federally mandated operating rules. And for now, from a federal mandate perspective, the original versions that were mandated in regulation continue to be what is required under the federal mandate. So those initial requirements are still the federally mandated requirements and the versions of those rules are available on our website. And we're happy to send you the direct links to those. What we will be doing is working with NCBHS, as I mentioned, over the coming months to consider whether updating, whether they uh, will be recommending an update to those originally mandated versions uh, to HHS. And of course, the regulatory timeline there is in process would be that NCBHS would hold um, hearing and public comment um, to uh, better understand the industry's thoughts and feedbacks on the value of updating these mandated requirements. And then there would be um, 25 months, or then HHS would decide whether or not to create a regulation, and then there would be about 25 months the industry would have to implement any um, new or updated operating rule requirements under HIPAA. So two kind of two different timelines, one for core certification, which is voluntary uh, within your organization, and then a potential track um, for uh, moving these rules um, through the federal process, um, but we will continue to update the industry at our town hall meetings and other events on the status of that over the coming year. Thanks, Erin. I want to open the next question up to all of our speakers. Um, do you think these uh, attachment requirements will help drive 278 adoption? I'll take a first swing and if anyone else wants to um, jump in. I think that um, with the rules that CAQH core participants have put together previously for the 278, and that includes specifics um, for timing, um, infrastructure for the conduct of the 278, specific data content and usage of the transaction. Um, again, the transaction allows for a fire hose and which has probably made it more cumbersome to implement more fully automated background uh, back-end systems. 
So with the operating rules that we previously had for the 278, combined with the operating rules now for the support of attachments, um, health plans can build systems that can better adjudicate the flow of information from a provider. Right? There's key pieces of data that are required from the provider to submit in the 278 so that a determination can be made to approve or, or not approve um, or to pend that transaction. Um, with the data content rules, with the attachment rules, with the reassociation rules, it makes it much easier for implementers to combine those types of requirements for that interaction to take place and then build supporting systems and applications to do that. Not just health plans, but we also see this with vendors. Um, we've had a really successful uh, pilot program um, initiated between Cleveland Clinic and a, a vendor that they use, um, Prior Off Now. Um, we have a whole web series on those as well. They've implemented the transaction, the 278 transaction in real time, um, along with the ways to submit the extra data that's required to remove pens from a 278. So we have success stories in industry today using the 278 in batch and in real time with appropriate um, standards that those vendors and health plans and providers have, have agreed upon to use uh, for the attachments. And so we're seeing that momentum continue to build, I think, for um, ways to implement and interoperate for prior authorizations. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I know we're closing up on the hour. So before I let everyone go, I want to mention our upcoming uh, education sessions and events. On May 17th, we'll be hosting one of our quarterly town halls. You can also um, hear some of our, uh, hear us speak at the Indetic EDI Summit on May 9th, as well as the Weedy Spring Conference um, between May 23rd and 26th. I want to thank all of you for joining us, um, our panel, Donna, Molly, and Mahesh, uh, for leading our work groups and for taking uh, the time out of their day to just to speak with all of us and inform us on all of the new requirements. Uh, please reach out to us at core at caqh.org if you have any follow-up questions. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all. Good afternoon. Thank you.